Hey everyone, this is Ryan here and welcome back to our prostodontic series and in this video we're going to continue where we left off by talking about the removable partial denture framework and we're going to add to our framework the rests and proximal plates. So you may be familiar with this picture from our last video and we talked about the major connector, we talked about these little minor connectors that branch off. We also mentioned the meshwork that will lock into and hold the acrylic and the denture teeth of the partial. Now these little parts at the ends of the minor connectors are called the rests and that's what we'll start talking about right now. So the rests are rigid extensions of an RPD framework that contact the occlusal, lingual, or incisal surface of an abutment tooth. And the function of these rests is to direct forces through the long axis of those abutment teeth. And this provides support. Now support is one of those three buzzwords that board examiners love to use. Those being support, stability, and retention. And we had a whole video dedicated to unpacking those three buzzwords. So the rest provides resistance to vertical seating forces because it provides a rigid vertical stop that keeps the partial from being seated any further down on those abutment teeth. And the rest seat is prepared into the occlusal, lingual, or incisal surface of the abutment tooth in order to receive and support a rest. You might have uh, wondered what this little part of the tooth here is, and it's not uh, purely anatomical because an operator had to um, use a handpiece and burr to make this space so a rest could fit in. So there are different rest seats and it depends on which surface they're being prepared. So you can see the example here, an occlusal rest. Here's an example of a lingual or cingulum rest as it's prepared into the cingulum of these teeth or an incisal rest which is prepared into the incisal surface. So it depends on what teeth you're talking about, what surface you choose to use. So the rest is part of the metal framework, whereas the rest seat is prepared into the tooth. So there's a different kind of rest and corresponding rest seat for each of these three surfaces. And let's go into a little bit more detail about each of these specifically. So the occlusal rest is a rounded semicircular outline form, and it can be described as spoon shaped. An occlusal rest would contact the occlusal surface of any posterior abutment tooth. So a premolar, like in this image, or a molar, like over here. Those are both occlusal rests. For some measurement guidelines, they're typically about one third the mesiodistal width of the tooth. And you can see in this image here how the rest that's being prepared is, yeah, that's roughly about one third of, maybe a little bit more than one third of the mesiodistal width of that tooth. In the other direction, buccolingually, it's about one half the intercuspal width. So for the premolar where you have a buccal and a lingual cusp, it's about a half the distance between those two cusps. And very important, the rest has to be at least 1.5 millimeters deep for the base metal, meaning that you have to prepare enough depth in order for the actual rest, the actual metal part of the framework, to be thick enough. Otherwise, if you don't leave enough room, the uh, rest would be too thin and could potentially bend or break. So you want to make sure you prepare enough space, much like when you make a crown prep, you want to make sure you have enough space so that the material thickness is adequate. Notice also how the floor of, the, um, of this tooth preparation inclines apically toward the center. That's what this black line is showing here. 
how it doesn't just go straight across and up like that. It actually kind of dips down, nice rounded outline form, and then dips back up. So you have this apical incline towards the center as you move inwards. And again, the angle formed with the vertical minor connector, which is going to be, um, if you have the major connector going across the palate or going uh, around the mandibular alveolar ridge, you have the vertical minor connector and it ends in the rest. The angle between the minor connector and the rest is probably about less than, somewhere less than 90 degrees because of this apical inclination towards the center. Next we have the cingulum rest, which is uh, much different because it's on a different surface. So instead of having the spoon shape, we're having an inverted V or U shape design. And so the cingulum rest is contacting the cingulum area of an anterior abutment tooth. Could be an incisor, not very likely, usually more so a canine. So the measurements here are slightly different. Instead of having um, one third the mesiodistal length, we're having 2.5 to 3 millimeters mesiodistal length, which is much of the tooth length here. Also about two millimeters labiolingual width. And this is to provide an adequate ledge for the, again, for the rest to have enough thickness. So labiolingual, we're talking forward to backward here. Uh, background into the foreground should be about two millimeters to have a ledge right here so that the metal can rest on that part of the tooth. And again, we want it to be about 1.5 millimeters deep. That's in the vertical dimension. Again, for that metal thickness. Notice how these measurements may be different between the rests, but so far that 1.5 millimeter measurement is um, the same, and we'll actually see that in the next rest as well. So like I said, it's mostly for canines, and it's contraindicated for mandibular incisors. Benefits include good distribution of the occlusal load, aesthetics, patient can't really see this if it's on the lingual surface, strength from closeness to the major connector, which in many cases is connecting directly to a cingulum rest. And there's not even a need sometimes for a minor connector at all. And lastly, we have the incisal rest. And this one is, again, a totally different shape from the other two, a rounded notch at the incisal angle. Again, we have about 2.5 millimeters mesiodistal length and 1.5 millimeters deep. So these two measurements are pretty similar, in this case, exactly similar to the cingulum rest. The incisal rest can also be used as an indirect retainer, which we'll touch on at the end of the video. It's a less favorable leverage than the lingual rest or the cingulum rest, and it's not used often because of aesthetic compromise. The lingual or cingulum rest was on the cingulum in this case, and so you won't even be able to see it from this view, whereas the incisal rest takes a pretty handy notch out of this corner and you would be able to see the metal peeking out from a facial view. So it's not all that favorable in those regards. All right, next let's talk about the proximal plate. This is yet another component of the framework. And it's a metal plate that contacts the proximal surface of an abutment tooth. So here you can see the netting or the meshwork that's going to hold the denture teeth and the acrylic in this bounded edentulous space, and these vertical components that are contacting the mesial surface of this molar and the distal surface of this uh, premolar, or possibly even canine, are the proximal plates. And uh, important to note, this is technically a type of minor connector, because it's connected between the major connector and the rest of the components of the partial. So proximal plates are a very specific type of minor connector that contact proximal surfaces of the abutment tooth. And the um, corollary to this is the guide plane. And this is a flat parallel surface 
of the abutment tooth that provides a path of insertion and removal. So this is the vertical surface of the tooth adjacent to an edentulous space or distal extension that literally guides the seating and removal of the partial. This is where the proximal plate would be contacting. So the guide plane is not usually the, the natural surface of the tooth and may require some preparation by means of the operator to smooth that surface of the tooth that's adjacent to the bounded edentulous space. In other words, the natural contour of those teeth may create some sort of undercut underneath here. And in order that the metal be a little bit straighter up and down, the operator might have to plane that surface with a tapered or straight diamond or carbide or whatever they're most comfortable using in order to provide a flatter, more parallel surface so that the uh, partial can be guided and inserted uh, much easier for the patient. So the guide plane should be on average about one third the buccal lingual width of that tooth, and it extends about two to three millimeters vertically down from the marginal ridge. So if here's our marginal ridge for this tooth, about two to three millimeters down, that's where the guide plane would be there, and this is about where the guide plane would be for the molar. So sometimes depending on how those teeth are rotated and tilted, you might not need one, but if there is a severe undercut, then it's most likely required that you have to plane that surface just a little bit. So like, much like we had the rest as part of the metal and the rest seat is part of the tooth, we have the proximal plate, which is part of the metal, the guide plane, which is part of the tooth. And lastly, let's talk about the indirect retainer. So let's go through a very brief physics lesson to start. We have a distal extension area of a partial, and you can see in this image here, and it's loose, which means it's not anchored posteriorly. In other words, the left side is anchored posteriorly since we have um, this nice rest on this molar here, and so this can't be, again, can't be seated any further down because the metal's contacting the tooth surface, which is a nice hard, firm surface. Whereas this distal extension is not anchored posteriorly and it can sort of flap up and down with the bounciness of the soft tissue of the ridge. And so because of that, there's rotational movement centered around an imaginary line drawn through the most distal rests. And this is really, really important. So we look at this partial design and there's a similar design on the right side, but I'll get uh, to that in a little bit. And you want to find the most distal rest on both sides. So for the patient's left side here, this would be the most distal rest. On the patient's right side, the most distal rest would be right here. So once we find that, we then draw an imaginary line between these two most distal rests. So I'll try to get as close to a straight line as I can. That's not too bad. And so once we have that line there, that is the axis of rotation. And I'll just call it AR for short. So this is the line that the partial would rotate about due to the bounciness of the soft tissue from this distal extension. And so the indirect retainer is ideally directly perpendicular and anterior to this axis of rotation, sometimes also called a fulcrum line, which provides bracing to resist this rotational movement of the distal extension area. Of course, the patient doesn't want to have to deal with that, so we place an indirect retainer to help with retention of the partial that has a distal extension. So we take this axis of rotation, we draw a line perpendicular and anterior to it, and lo and behold, that's a perfect location to have an indirect retainer. And the indirect retainer is mostly, most nine times out of 10, probably even more than that, it's a rest. And so the rest is going to provide the indirect retention. So the rest 
on this first premolar canine area is the indirect retainer for this partial. And this one is not quite the same. It's similar in design, but this is for an upper arch. There's an added bounded edentulous space here. And you can see the process was very similar. We looked at the most distal rest here, most distal rest here, drew a line through it, called it the axis of rotation. This is the uh, arrow symbolizing how that partial would rotate. And we draw a line perpendicular and anterior. And there would be our indirect retainer is a rest, a nice cingulum rest here on the canine. And so it's important, uh, there's some controversy about this concept, but this is what I believe you should know for the board exam in case you get a question about an indirect retainer. So there's also called something, uh, there's also something called a direct retainer, which we'll talk about in the next video on clasps. And it's the indirect retainer and the direct retainers of a partial that together pr prevent displacement of the denture base in an occlusal direction. In other words, they both together provide retention for the partial so it doesn't fall out on the patient. All right, so thanks so much for watching this video, everyone. I hope you found it helpful and informative in your studies. Stay tuned for the next video on clasp design and selection. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.